All right. Thanks, everybody, for making it out today. And thanks, Grant, for agreeing to give a talk. Um, today, we have our own graduate student, Grant Fix, who will be talking about recurrence ranks of sequences. Go ahead and take us away, Grant. Thanks for the invitation, Drew. And uh, thanks to everybody for tuning in and, and giving me an hour of your time to, to uh, listen to what uh, Josh and I had uh, to work on. So um, I'd just like to take a, a quick minute to, to thank Josh for the opportunity to work with him and for his endless uh, patience and encouragement uh, through our entire process. So I look forward to what we can continue to do uh, in, in the years to come. So this, uh, I've titled the presentation Recurrence Ranks of Sequences. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, develop a couple definitions for different kinds of ranks um, as it pertains to sequences. So the, the context for, um, let me turn the annotate on, I guess I, Okay, um, so uh, the context for this work is, so Josh, Josh does a lot of, uh, works in a lot of different areas, but one of them being uh, hypergraphs and, and spectral hypergraph theory, and that was the motivation for these ideas. So characteristic polynomials are something that we can look at in, in terms of graphs. We can look at the, the adjacency matrix of a graph, and like any matrix, we can look at its, its characteristic polynomial. So we, we call that the characteristic polynomial of a graph. And there's a lot of information known about these characteristic polynomials for graphs because there are a lot of linear algebra tools that you can apply um, to gain information about a graph based on its characteristic polynomial. But uh, for hypergraphs, not nearly as much is, is known about these characteristic polynomials. So a couple examples of some things that are known. For example, a, a three uniform hyper edge. Now, what that looks like is for a simpleton like me, it looks like a triangle. Uh, it, it has three vertices. Uh, three uniform just means that all of the edges in the graph are three subsets of the vertices. So in just standard graphs, we have a vertex set and an edge set, and every edge is a two subset of the vertices. In hypergraphs, we relax that condition, and any subset of the vertex set can define an edge. Uh, but the, the most convenient hypergraphs have all of the edges are the same size or connect the same number of vertices. Uh, so we call that, that cardinality of an edge set or the number of vertices that every edge connects, we call that uniformity. So a three uniform hyper edge is three vertices and there's one edge that connects them. You, it might be drawn like a triangle or you might think of it as like a face, for example, uh, but that's, that's what it looks like. It has characteristic polynomial given by this. So if our variable is lambda, then the, the characteristic polynomial of that graph is, is lambda cubed times lambda cubed minus one cubed. So right away, you notice that the degree of this polynomial is 12. There's, there's uh, a lambda cubed, and then the, the term lambda cubed minus one cubed that, that, con that contributes uh, nine to the degree. So in, in graphs, just by themselves, the degree of the characteristic polynomial is given by just the number of vertices or the, so, or the order of the graph that we're working in. Whereas here right away, we see with hypergraphs that the characteristic polynomial degree is much, much larger typically than uh, the actual, the number of vertices or the, the order of the graph. Now a k-uniform hyperedge in general. So again, just trying to picture this, if you're not familiar with hypergraphs, it looks to me like a K cycle, if we're just thinking about it in terms of graphs, but really what it is, is it's K vertices all connected with one edge. Um, and sometimes it's drawn like a K cycle, sometimes it's it's kind of shaded in, so it looks like the, the face of some kind of surface. This is the, the characteristic polynomial of the K uniform hyper edge. And what I'd really like you to notice is there's this, this large power of lambda, so zero is a root of this characteristic polynomial, and then it has the K roots of unit as well. Uh, to some relatively high degrees. So there are other uh, results known about characteristic polynomials of hypergraphs. Uh, Greg Clark, uh, who worked under Josh as well, he graduated two years ago and is off at Oxford uh, at a postdoc there. He, he did a couple results which uh, looked at a couple different hypergraphs. Um, some of them I've included here just for some reference for us. This is called the Rawling hypergraph um, because uh, J.K. Rawling wrote um, the Harry Potter books, and this is a, a symbol that comes up in there. Um, but he, he found, uh, he and Josh worked together, found the characteristic polynomial for this hypergraph. And again, we can see that the, the degree is quite large. 
And the, 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 the sheer size of this degree is, is one of the reasons that it's complicated to compute characteristic polynomials of these hypergraphs. Uh, the computation is NP-hard in general. Um, and just thinking about it, the way we compute characteristic polynomials for graphs, we're taking the determinant of some matrix. Um, the adjacency matrix for hypergraphs is, is a tensor or a hypermatrix, however you want to think about it. So it's this, uh, for three uniform, it's a, a three-dimensional block or box of numbers that we have to try to take determinant of. There are still notions of determinant for those tensors. Um, I won't get into exactly what those are, but it's much more complicated to compute compared to uh, the nice methods that we have to compute determinants of just general matrices. Uh, now, the, the reason I include this in, in here is if I draw in an edge here, an edge there, what I've drawn now is uh, the phantom plane. So it just has two additional edges. So this graph has seven vertices. It's a three uniform hypergraph. Um, so all of the edges connect three different vertices in the graph. If I just add these two additional edges, then it, we turn it into the Fano plane. But it, it's, it's actually unknown what the characteristic polynomial of the Fano plane is. So just, just adding those two extra edges uh, takes us from a hypergraph whose characteristic polynomial we know to a hypergraph whose characteristic polynomial is still unknown. Um, so that kind of provides us with a little bit of context on just how hard these characteristic polynomials are to compute. The last particular example that I want to consider is this, this thing called the hummingbird hypergraph. It looks something like this. Uh, this, is, this hypergraph falls into a, a very nice or a very simple class of hypergraphs, namely uh, linear trees. Um, so linear just means that any two edges that you choose to take the intersection of their vertex sets. And the size of that intersection is at most one. So any edge, any two edges have at most one vertex in common. Uh, they play nicely in terms of different things. And uh, trees just in, in the graph context are, are graphs connected uh, with no cycles. So you can kind of see here that this graph is connected. Um, and then there are, there are a couple different notions of what it means to be a tree. In, in the hypergraph context, because there are a couple different notions of what it means to be a cycle. But no matter what definition you choose, there's no cycle in this particular hypergraph, because no matter what two vertices you choose, there's, there's really only one way to get between them. Again, noting that each of these triangle looking things are really just one edge. But anyway, this, this hypergraph has characteristic polynomial given by this, quite large. Um, a lot to look at, a lot of different routes, but there's the one route that we do see here is uh, zero. So here, the, the factor lambda has degree or multiplicity almost 21,000, quite large. But anyway, the, the thing that all three of these examples have in common is that zero was a root of all of the characteristic polynomials we saw. The K uniform hyperedge had this factor lambda the, to the K times K minus one to the K minus one minus k to the k minus one, a, a, a decent factor there of, of just lambda. So there's the zero root in that characteristic polynomial. The Rowling hypergraph characteristic polynomial had this lambda to the 133rd power. And then as we just saw in the hummingbird hypergraph, the multiplicity of zero there was almost 21,000. So it seems like zero is, is pretty common as a root of many of these hypergraphs. So what we wanted to do was kind of study and see if we could figure out some bounds or maybe exact ways to compute the multiplicity of the zero eigenvalue for a particular hypergraph. So one technique that comes up fairly often in trying to prove results for hypergraphs and hypergraph characteristic polynomials is to take some notion from graphs and see if you can extend it to something interesting in regards to hypergraphs. So the unfortunate thing in this setting is there isn't a nice result for graphs that allows us to compute or, or gives us interesting bounds on the multiplicity of zero for a given graph. So we couldn't really pursue that, that avenue. So we had to come up with something new. We had to try something else. Um, so that's where these, these uh, sequences come into play. And we'll see how this, this comes up here. So let's just suppose we have some hypergraph. It's got some characteristic polynomial. I'm going to call it f of x. 
then what we're interested in at the moment is the multiplicity of the eigenvalue zero as a root of this polynomial. So there's a couple ways to think of that. If you just have some polynomial, for example, maybe you have like x to the fourth plus x cubed, then you can factor an x cubed out of there and you're left with x plus one. So one way to think about the multiplicity of the zero root of a given polynomial is just the largest non-negative integer so that when you take your original polynomial f of x, divide out x to whatever this, this power is, we'll call it m, you still get a polynomial. Uh, so that's one way to think about the multiplicity of this zero root. So I'm going to let uh, g bar be the reciprocal of g. So g is defined to be uh, essentially f of x, what's left of that polynomial after you divide out all of the, the copies of just x. Um, so the, the constant term of, of g is non-zero, um, but g is, g is still a polynomial. So the reciprocal of a polynomial, uh, here's, a, here's a formula for it. Essentially, the way you can think about it is take g as a polynomial, just rearrange all the coefficients, um, flip them, just re reverse their order. So uh, the leading coefficient and the constant term flip, uh, the linear term coefficient, and the co-degree one or the, the degree minus one coefficient, they flip. You just do that the whole way through. Um, but more rigorously, you can think about just taking the polynomial g, plugging in one over x, and then multiplying everything by uh, x to the, the degree of the original polynomial we have. That's the algebraic way to reverse the order of all of the coefficients. Um, but no matter how you'd like to think about it, I'm going to let g bar of x be the reciprocal of this polynomial g. And I, I want to look at this, this difference here. So uh, because g bar is the reciprocal polynomial of g, then the constant term, or, or g of 0, is actually the leading coefficient of g bar. So remember that uh, subtraction outside of two logarithms turns into division inside of the log. So really what I'm doing here is this expression takes g bar and divides by the leading coefficient. Uh, this is then, if I, if I combine these in that way, I have a monic polynomial, or the, I guess rather the log of a monic polynomial. But over C, this polynomial factors. Uh, and I guess I want to look at the, the factorization of just the polynomial G over the complex numbers. That way I can write G bar as a product of, of 1 minus these roots times X. Uh, because then again, multiplication inside of a log turns into addition. So outside the log. So I break that up, look at the sum, and that's, that's one way to, to represent those. The nice thing about reciprocal polynomials is if I have a root of the original polynomial g, as long as that root is non-zero, then one over that root is uh, a zero of g bar. So that's what allows me to factor it in this way, noting that zero is not a root of g because we took f and divided out all of the, uh, the powers of x that uh, all of the terms had in common. So zero is not a root of g, so we don't have to worry about anything here. Um, this is one minus some non-zero constant times x. Um, so there's there's no like extra terms or extra information here. We really do have degree of g terms in this in this sum. Now log, I can I can look at the the uh, Taylor series expansion of log, um, and uh, you might say, well, uh, what about uh, convergence? Uh, throughout the entire the entire presentation, we're going to look at some some power series concepts. I'm not terribly concerned with convergence. Um, in I think all of the cases, you could take a small enough disk around zero and we get convergence. But we're really just concerned about these formal power series. So if we look at the the power series expansion of log, um, we get something like this. So then what we're interested in is notice if we would flip the order of summation here. The coefficient on x to the j for some particular j is then the sum of deg degree of g terms. But these, these coefficients are all some complex number, bi, raised to the j's power. I, I know we're dividing by, by j. But essentially, uh, aside from this extra little divisor, all of the coefficients of the powers of x in this Taylor series are the sum of some finite number of uh, jth powers and complex numbers. So sometimes we can be given information about a sum that has this kind of form. And what we would like to do is express these coefficients in this form, in this, this uh, a sum of some finite number of jth powers, 
And then we can take all this information and go backwards and, and try to gain some information about uh, the original characteristic polynomial of the graph. Because we know, we know the degree of the characteristic polynomial. Um, it's actually, if we have uh, an n vertex hypergraph with uniformity k, um, I believe the, the degree is n times k minus 1 to the n minus 1 power. Um, so we know the degree of f. If we could gather some information like this about either g or g bar, essentially, we're, they're the, the same kind of thing, just the context makes them look a little bit different. Um, but if we have some information like this, and we can find whatever this, this positive number needs to be, the smallest, the smallest positive integer, so that we can express all of these coefficients as jth powers, um, as the, the sum of that many jth powers, then we can determine the degree of g and g bar. And then comparing that with the degree of f, that can tell us what this, this non-negative integer m needs to be. Uh, or maybe we can provide bounds or something like that. But that's the game that we're going to play. We're going to find the smallest integer r so that those coefficients times j uh, can be written as a sum of these, these r different j powers. And then that tells us some information about the degree of g bar, um, or I guess really um, g itself. Okay. So uh, why is this useful? So there are some situations, like I was mentioning, where we can get information about the polynomial log of g, or maybe g itself, and that provides us with uh, some extra information like this. So uh, we'll go through, we'll develop the tools that we, that we found that we can use to, to help us get this information, and uh, we'll apply it uh, towards the end. Okay. So let's take some complex, complex sequence. Okay, I'm going to let C be the, the sequence where this will be preserved the whole way through. I'll keep defining it where we need it. Um, but we'll let C be the sequence that we're looking at. Uh, and what does it mean for it to satisfy an rth order linear recurrence? So uh, I'm sure all, all the faculty have seen all this um, before, but for the grad students, I, I know from personal experience that uh, it's, it's nice to be able to understand a little bit of a talk. Um, so I'll go through uh, kind of slowly. Um, maybe and uh, go through these definitions and, and talk about them a little bit. Um, but if I have some sequence, we know what recurrences are. Uh, we define sequences using a recursive definition all the time. Um, but what does an rth order linear recurrence mean? Well, think about the, the Fibonacci sequence, OK? If I have uh, two consecutive terms of the sequence, add them together, you get the one after that. Um, so if, if I call that Fn for, my, for the Fibonacci numbers, Fn plus Fn plus 1, is fn plus 2. Um, so that would be a second order recurrence um, because it takes two of the previous terms to define the next one. Um, if you think about moving that all of the terms over to one side, uh, then it's a second order recurrence, but we really have three terms over there. Uh, so that's what this expression is. Um, we really have r plus 1 terms here, um, but because we've set it equal to 0, essentially what we're saying is the, the, the terms with index 0 through r minus 1 are, provide us with enough information uh, to define the rth term of the sequence. But again, moving that all over to one side, we get really r plus one terms on that side. So all of these a's are just some complex coefficients, some complex constants. Um, and again, our, our sequence is, is complex. That's why the, the constants are complex. But essentially what we've done here is we have a, a non-trivial uh, linear combination of r plus one terms of our sequence that get us zero. So that's what we mean by an rth order uh, linear recurrence. Linear just because all of these uh, coefficients are just constants. They have nothing to do with, with anything else. We can uh, look at the characteristic polynomial associated with a particular sequence. And essentially, all we do is replace uh, c to the i, or c sub i, with x to the i. Um, so if we just uh, think about this for one second, uh, our sum is going from, from 0 to r. Uh, so the first term is a0, c0, and then a1, c1. Uh, essentially, what we're doing is ai is going to be the coefficient of x to the i in this polynomial. We call this the characteristic polynomial associated with the particular recurrence that we have. And we call the original recurrence simple if this characteristic polynomial has distinct complex groups. Um, so again, it's a complex polynomial, so we can factor it into, completely factor it over C. 
get all these linear factors, determine all of the roots. Uh, and if it has all distinct roots, then we call the original recurrence simple. The reason that we're concerned with these simple linear occurrences is because there's a really nice uh, age old result in, in, this, in this theory of linear recurrence is that if we have a, a simple linear recurrence like this or some finite order linear recurrence where the characteristic polynomial has all distinct roots, then we can express an arbitrary term of our sequence uh, as the sum of the R roots to these, these n plus first powers times some appropriate complex constant. Um, so the nice thing again about these simple linear recurrences is we get this form for any term of the sequence. Okay, so we define the moment rank of some complex sequence and we denote it in this way. It's the smallest positive integer. So there exists non-zero alphas, distinct betas that have this form. So essentially what I've done is uh, I've taken the form from the, the last slide and used that as the definition for moment rank. Um, so it might be possible to write or express the, the terms of our sequence in this kind of form for different values of R, maybe um, an R1 and an R2, R3, or something like that. But we're going to take the smallest or the, the minimum possible um, value for this, for the, the top end of this series or finite sum. And the name of the game that we're going to play here is try to find some equivalent conditions to a sequence having moment rank R. Um, and then we'll, we'll look at an example then of, of how this helps us in the, the work or the case that we're considering. So what we already talked about highlights for us that if a particular complex, complex sequence has moment rank R, then that's equivalent to R being the smallest positive integer so that our sequence satisfies an R order simple recurrence. Uh, so almost from the definition, we see that those two things are equivalent. Definitely uh, moment rank R implies uh, the recurrence business. Um, and it, it's not too difficult to see that uh, the, the implication goes the other way as well, proving that these two things are equivalent. So before we continue any farther, it would be really, really nice to know that the moment rank of a particular sequence is, is well-defined. Um, when I started working with Josh on this, um, I didn't know that it was possible for a particular sequence to satisfy multiple linear occurrences simultaneously. So this question by itself, I, I didn't even consider because I didn't realize that was even a thing. Like example, if I go back to the, the, Fib the Fibonacci numbers, uh, we all know the recurrence that they satisfy, but they, they satisfy infinitely more linear recurrences as well. If you look at the, the characteristic polynomial for a particular recurrence, if you multiply in some other distinct linear term. Um, so take a, another root or another value that's outside the roots of the characteristic polynomial. Multiply in the factor that's associated with that. Distribute everything out. You get another polynomial. Degree is one higher. And if you go back, uh, take that, that polynomial and go back to a recurrence, well, your original sequence is going to satisfy that one as well. Um, so actually, you can take one linear recurrence and, and generate infinitely many other recurrences that the, the sequence that you have satisfies. That was a foreign concept to me, but once I was introduced to that, that, that makes me realize that this question is, is actually valid and important. So let's take a sequence. Suppose that uh, we have some kind of form like this. So what I've done is I've assumed that our, our sequence values can be described in the moment rank uh, definition. They can be described in two different ways. So I'm going to take the sum from i equals 1 to r of the alphas times betas to the n plus one. But let's also suppose that there's another positive integer s uh, so that the original sequence terms can be described as the sum from j equals one to s of alpha prime beta prime, again, to the power n plus one. Let's take the ordinary generating function of the sequence that we're looking at. So we're multiplying in by z to the n and taking the sum from n equals zero to infinity on both sides. And by doing this, what we can, we, we can uh, use all of our complex analysis tools. Um, so now we have all of that at our disposal to kind of uh, give us some information on what's really going on here. So anytime we have multiple sums, again, we're working over formal power series. But I think if you take a small enough disk, it all works in, in regular power series anyway. But we can switch the order of summation. 
And uh, now the, this interior sum is the sum from n equals zero to infinity. You notice we have a z to the n, we have a beta to the n plus one. So if we pull the alpha and one copy of beta out of this internal sum, because this, this interior sum only depends on n, can pull alpha and one copy of beta out. And now we have z times beta to the n power. So that's one over, that's the form x to the n, one over one minus x. Uh, so we, we look at those, we make that, that simplification. And now we have two finite sums of these rational expressions, these fractions. Um, so if you stare at it for 10 seconds or so and think about a little bit of complex analysis, um, we see that all of the betas have to be the same because the poles of both of these functions have to be the same set. Um, and then once we, we make that conclusion, um, the alphas are going to be the same thing as well. So um, R and S have to be the same value. And the multi-set of betas, um, I guess they're just sets because they're distinct. So the set of betas and the set of beta primes are also the same. Um, so we assume that there were two different representations um, using the, the moment rank definition for a particular sequence um, and derived that, well, really they are the same thing. So what this tells us is moment rank is, is well-defined for a particular sequence. And it makes sense to continue this endeavor of trying to find uh, conditions or settings where we can find equivalent conditions to the moment rank of a sequence being some number of R, okay? Uh, so there's a variety of different contexts where we, where we turn to and can find uh, equivalent conditions. One of my favorites was this one here. So we looked at, at an algebra setting because we said, okay, we have these these recurrences, and they immediately correspond to polynomials. So it's, it can be interesting to study these polynomials. Uh, I already mentioned briefly that I, if I have some recurrence, I can multiply extra factors in to get recur recurrences of other orders. Um, so that, that immediately makes us realize that this, if we kind of take the set of all of the characteristic polynomials associated to linear recurrences that a sequence satisfies, it's going to be closed under multiplication, but also closed under multiplication by just complex polynomials in general. So that kind of leads us towards some kind of algebraic structure. So I'm going to let this, this script R sub C um, be uh, a set for now in the complexes of join X. Um, so all complex polynomials in one variable. Uh, and again, these are, these are all of the polynomials, uh, characteristic polynomials for all of the linear recurrences that our original sequence C satisfies. It turns out that this set is an ideal. Uh, so that's kind of what I was leading towards. It's closed under multiplication by, by any complex polynomial. Um, and it, it's, it's closed under addition. That's, that's not too bad to see. If I have two linear recurrences um, and I add them together, well, that's going to give me another linear recurrence because each one by themselves uh, in our definition where everything, all of the terms are on one side and it's equal to zero, add two things that are both equal to zero, you still get a sum of zero. Uh, and then that creates a, a new linear recurrence for us. Um, and the polynomials reflect that in the same exact way. Um, so it's really not too bad to see that this set is closed under addition and closed under multiplication by any complex polynomial. So we get that this set of these uh, recurrence characteristic polynomials is an ideal. And the nice thing about C is it's a field. So C adjoin X is a, a PID. Uh, so there's some unique, um, but not unique, um, up to scalar multiplication. Uh, but there's some polynomial that, that generates this ideal. Um, so this was, this was a, a really interesting thing for us. Um, and then how do we then use that uh, to adapt it and apply it to the situation that we're trying to, to look at? So if we have uh, a sequence with moment rank R, then essentially what that's going to correspond to is this polynomial F has to have degree R, and it has to have distinct roots. Um, and that's essentially what we say here. The other interesting thing about that is if F has those properties, so just if, if F, um, regardless of its degree, if it has distinct roots, uh, then this ideal is, is radical. Um, radical just means that if you have some power of a polynomial within your ideal, then you have the original polynomial itself. So if, if for example, P is some polynomial, if P to the 12th power is in this ideal, or 
just a, a radical ideal in general. But if p to the 12th power is in here, then that, what that tells us is p by itself needs to be in there as well. Um, so this was one context where we were able to come up with an equivalent condition. Another place that we turned to were Hankel matrices. Um, so I'm going to develop conditions on some finite Hankel matrices, um, but then we're also going to look at some infinite Hankel matrices as well. Um, so Hankel matrices has a have a special form. Essentially, what these are going to look at is some finite portion of whatever infinite sequence we're looking at. We use this notation to define the matrices. So M, this first parameter, is going to give us the, the size of our matrix. Um, we're actually going to define it to be of size M plus 1 by M plus 1. Um, so it's a square matrix, so things will work out nicely. Um, but yeah, we're going we're gonna to let M be the parameter but the size be m plus 1 by m plus 1. We'll see here in a second why that makes the most sense. Um, T, our second parameter, uh, just kind of gives us a shift in the sequence. So we might not always want to look at the initial segment of the sequence. We might want to look at some part farther down the line. Um, so we're going to let T denote the first index of the sequence that we're going to consider. And it'll be some finite part of the sequence starting from there. So what do Hankel matrices look like? The formally, uh, the IJ entry is given by that value there. But if just looking at an example, maybe I have a sequence, uh, just essentially the identity sequence. So CN is the value N. Um, and we're going to define this for, for non-negative integers. Um, then here's what a couple of our Hankel matrices look like. So our first parameter, the size is going to be one bigger than that. So the parameter is one. So we're looking at a two by two matrix. And we're going to start with the, the first term of the sequence, the one with index zero. Um, so essentially, these Hankel matrices are um, identical on anti-diagonals. So typically, our, our main diagonal is given this. We go down into the right. Anti-diagonals go the opposite way. Um, but any anti-diagonal, uh, the Hankel matrices are constant. But essentially, what we do is we, we take the first m plus 1, or the first parameter plus 1 terms of wherever we're starting our sequence, write those down in the row, and then shift everything over by 1 to get subsequent rows. Um, so in this way, uh, this is the, the c0 term, c1, but then c1, c2. So we get 0, 1, 1, 2. Here, uh, the first parameter is 2. So we're working with 3 by 3 matrices, and we're starting with the fifth term in the sequence. So uh, we get this matrix here, 5, 6, 7, 6, 7, 8, and then 7, 8, 9. Just take the first row start with this term in the sequence. And then once you have the entire row, shift everything over by one. So these are what our finite Hankel matrices look like. Um, what are we going to do with this? Well, if we think about matrices and their determinant, we know that the determinant of a matrix is 0. Uh, if we go all the way back to our introductory linear algebra class, we learned a laundry list of different equivalent conditions to a matrix having determinant 0, one of them being that there's some non-trivial linear combination of the columns, which give us the zero vector or the zero point. And we're going to use that and exploit that in this particular setting. So let's suppose that we have some sequence, uh, our normal definition. Let's, let's say it has moment rank r. Uh, I'm going to uh, look at the, we know that because it has moment rank r, we've already said that there's some rth order simple linear recurrence that the sequence satisfies. I'm going to let the vector a or the column a contain all of the coefficients of that recurrence. And we know that uh, this product is going to be 0. Because if we think about a row of our Hankel matrix, it's just because the parameter is r, it's going to be r plus 1 consecutive values of our sequence. And we know, just based on this moment rank r, that gives us our linear recurrence. So the dot product of that row of the Hankel matrix and this vector here, or is, yeah, that vector, um, is going to give us 0. Um, so what that tells us is that we get some non-trivial linear combination of the columns, which gives us 0. So the determinant, the determinant of this matrix is 0. And some interesting other consequences. I won't go through and, and uh, prove them. But the other behavior that happens here, the null space, which is uh, the vector space uh, which contains all vectors that have this property. So um, all null vectors, so a null vector just being um, 
when you multiply it by the original matrix that you have, you get zero. That's a null vector. Take the set of all those, they're actually a vector space. Um, this null space of, or the, the null space of the particular matrix, the Henkel matrix that we're looking at here, has dimension one. Uh, so this column here, which we generated from the coefficients of the linear recurrence satisfied by the sequence we have, that's actually uh, a generator where the, the span of that vector gives us the null space of this finite Henkel matrix. Um, and the we can kind of see then, so no matter what T value we choose, the null space always has dimension one. Um, so because of that, we already know a vector that's in the null space of all of these matrices. So it turns out that the null spaces of all of these matrices, no matter what shift that we use in the sequence, all of those null spaces are the same. Um, and if I take uh, some size Hankel matrix for anything smaller than this moment rank of the sequence, uh, the determinant is non-zero for all of those as well. So this is also kind of a consequence of the first two, um, because if the determinant was zero for some smaller uh, size or, or parameter, um, we would see that the null space would, would have higher dimension. Um, so the, the null space having dimension one uh, and this term here are kind of you can get one from the other. So if I take all three of these properties, uh, put them together, and then also specify that, so formally I've said here that A is in the complement of the affine R discriminant variety. Um, all that means is that if I look at the characteristic polynomial of the recurrence that, this, that these coefficients define, that it has distinct roots. Um, because we need that to correspond to the, the simpleness of the linear recurrence that we're that we're looking at. So um, put all these together, stipulate that A defines a polynomial which which has distinct roots, and that's equivalent to the original sequence having moment rank R. Okay. So I also said that we can consider infinite Hankel matrices. So let's go ahead and do that. This infinite Hankel matrix is constructed in the same way, um, just taking the first row, that's that's the sequence itself, and then shifting things over. As we go down through subsequent rows, we just now instead of having some finite matrix, it's an infinite one. So we can also explore some ideas here. So because our sequence has moment rank R, we know that the, the terms of the sequence take this form where the alphas are non zero and the betas are all distinct. Um, so Vandermond matrices, uh, hopefully, most of us have, have seen those before. Um, their first, their first uh, column is all ones. Then uh, their their second column is filled with with some value, and subsequent columns are higher powers of the values in the the second column. So we can take a Vandermond matrix. You can generate it by some particular values. I, I hope most of us have seen those before. Um, but you can. Uh, generate a Vandermond matrix from some collection of, of complex numbers or real numbers in general. Um, but if I take the Vandermond matrix generated by the betas that I have, and I take a diagonal matrix where the diagonal entry is alpha i times beta i, then when I look at this product here, I actually get uh, the sequence terms back. Um, so the Hankel matrix that we have that's populated by the sequence terms is going to be equal to this. We call this a Vandermond decomposition. Um, so essentially, we've we've decomposed this matrix, this Henkel matrix, into this product here, where D is again a diagonal matrix, and V is a Vandermond matrix generated by the distinct roots um, of the characteristic polynomial associated with the linear recurrence. Um, that's where these betas come from. So there's we can translate between this setting and the roots of the characteristic polynomial seamlessly. So uh, D is diagonal. All of the diagonal entries are, are non-zero. So it clearly has rank R. Uh, the same is true for the Vandermond matrix. Um, the Vandermond matrix are, actually has uh, R rows and infinitely many columns. Um, but it also has rank R because all of the betas are distinct. Um, so both of these matrices have rank R. And uh, a, little bit, a little bit of work is required, but we can see, um, and the ideas are kind of there that 
the infinite Hankel matrix H also has rank R. Uh, and uh, this, this Hankel matrix having rank R and giving a Vandermonde Mondi composition where the size of V is uh, R by infinity or, or just having R rows, that's also equivalent to our original sequence having rank R. Uh, another place that we can turn to are the, the notion of generating functions. So again, I have my, my uh, sequence C, it satisfies some rth order linear recurrence. I'm gonna let phi denote uh, the uh, ordinary generating function of this sequence. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply this ordinary generating function by this finite sum here. You might say, well, that's kind of odd. Why would you do that? Well, when you actually do the multiplication, if we look at uh, something in the product, a term in the product of these two, or this, this polynomial and the generating function, if the degree of the monomial that we're looking at is less than R, then we only get some of the terms out of this polynomial providing some kind of contribution. Um, and that, that chunk of this power series is given by this sum here, this finite sum. Notice that uh, even though we have double sums, they're both finite. Uh, whereas if the, the degree of the monomial that we're looking at is at least R, then we're going to get a contribution from all of these terms. And that's going to look something like this. Um, now, it, it takes a little bit of thought um, and, and some index chasing to, to realize that this is just a restatement of the recurrence that we satisfy. Things are shifted a little bit just depending on the actual value of j. Um, but this is just the linear recurrence that we satisfy. So this double sum here is really just 0. So we see that this product, the product of this polynomial and our ordinary generating function is equal to this polynomial. Notice that the power of x is, is j, and j ranges up to r minus 1. Um, so this is an r minus 1 degree polynomial. This is an r degree polynomial. So if we take this polynomial and, and divide it from both sides, we see that uh, phi, the ordinary generating function of the sequence we have, is a rational function. And the degree of the denominator is exactly the moment rank of the sequence that we started with. Um, and that's actually, a, so um, not just um, that denominator having degree r, but it factoring into distinct roots, meaning that uh, the generating function itself has r simple poles. That's equivalent to um, our sequence having moment rank r. So to just summarize some of these equivalent conditions for us, if we have a sequence with moment rank r, that's the same as R being the smallest positive integer, so that C satisfies an rth order simple uh, linear recurrence. We also had that finite uh, Hankel matrix condition. Um, that's summarized here. We also looked at uh, this ordinary generating function of uh, associated with the particular sequence that we started with. We looked at van der Maan decompositions of infinite Hankel matrices. We looked at uh, our recurrence ideal and uh, that the set of all of the polynomials associated to recurrences of our sequence actually form an ideal in C adjoin X and that that ideal is radical. Uh, and lastly, I didn't talk about this at all, um, but it, it, shouldn't, it might not be too hard to see that uh, our sequence having moment rank R is the same thing as satisfying a complex R atomic measure or, or being, sorry, the, uh, a complex R, uh, the moments. It's the moment sequence for a complex R atomic measure. Um, it's just the, the finite sum of some direct delta functions um, where the betas are, um, alphas are just the, the constants that go along for the ride. Um, so the, the title was something about uh, recurrence ranks, the plural. We've only talked about moment rank. Um, the other one that we, we defined, we specialized it to this context of unitary rank. Um, so unitary rank was actually the, the original uh, idea that we were going to employ to apply to these, these hypergraph characteristic polynomials. Um, but in working with it, we saw that there was this more general thing happening. That's where the moment rank idea is coming from. So unitary rank is really just a specialization of moment rank. Now we take our sequence to start with index one. Uh, we require that all of the alphas from the moment rank definition be one. And with that, we no longer require that the betas are distinct. Um, so this in general can be something different. For example, if we have the sequence defined as two times three to the n, just as an example, this is going to have moment rank one, but unitary rank two because of this, this extra coefficient here. 
Um, so this breaks into three to the n plus three to the n, which is the form required for unitary rank. But for a moment rank, uh, we can just let that alpha be two. The only beta is going to be three. So we see that this can be different depending on whatever sequence uh, we're looking at. So a lot of the statements that were equivalent for moment rank, we can translate them in some careful way, and we get a, an equivalent statement for unitary rank. But there's one new one that's worth mentioning. So again, let's take our sequence. Again, we're going to start with index one, um, and we'll see why uh, actually right here. We're going to consider this, this object here. So e to this integral, where phi is the ordinary generating function of a particular sequence that we're looking at. Um, so because the sequence starts with index 1, its constant term is 0. Um, so we can look at this, use power rule to integrate everything, and we get something that looks like this. Okay. Now notice right away, this kind of looks like log. Okay. So the, the, the exponential and the log are going to seemingly cancel. So when we exponentiate this, this is what happens. Because our sequence, we suppose that it has uh, unitary rank r, we can replace our sequence terms with this finite sum of these r nth powers. Um, so because the sequence now starts with, with index 1, we've shifted the power of betas down to match the index of the sequence. So we get that there are sequence values are the same as the sum from i equals 1 to r of these betas uh, to the nth power. Uh, and like any good uh, proof with two sums in it, we're going to flip the order of summation. And by doing this now, we've turned things into logs. Um, so a finite sum in the exponent of the exponential turns into a product of those exponentials. Now this is log. This is log of 1 minus beta times x e to the log, well, we know what happens there. We get a product of some linear factors. Um, so this is a polynomial of degree r. And those are actually equivalent as well. So if our sequence has unitary rank r, that's equivalent to this object here uh, being a polynomial of degree r with some non-zero roots. So in the last couple minutes that I have, I would like to um, go all the way back to the beginning and help us go through a, a very almost trivial example, but to illustrate the concepts and the ideas of how we can use these ideas to help us with graph and hypergraph characteristic polynomials. Um, so uh, we're just going to, I'm just going to consider a graph. We're going to look at just uh, the complete graph on invertices. Um, but the idea is then we can try to, to generalize uh, to the hypergraph case, because I mentioned that one technique is to take graph results and generalize them to hypergraphs. But there was no graph result for this. So this is an attempt maybe to look at a graph result and then help us uh, extend it to a hypergraph result. So if I have some graph with adjacency matrix A, uh, I have all of this linear algebra that we can apply to that adjacency matrix. So one of them being just the, just the rank nullity theorem. So um, the rank plus the nullity of the graph is equal to its, its order, assuming that we have um, a square adjacency matrix. Um, so the, the multiplicity of 0 as an eigenvalue for our adjacency, adjacency matrix is the same thing as the nullity. Um, so that's the order or the size of A minus its rank. Uh, the size of A is very easy to obtain just looking at the graph. Um, it's the number of vertices that we have, again, in the graph setting. Um, but what about the rank? Is it, is it possible to look at or, or uh, take properties of the graph? and determine the rank of this adjacency matrix. Um, the rank is actually the same thing as the number of non-zero eigenvalues of A. So you can take um, all of the eigenvalues. Um, you can look at the non-zero ones, the zero ones. The zeros correspond to the nullity. Non-zero corresponds to the rank. And the other interesting thing is that if I take the trace of some power of the adjacency matrix, trace, again, is just the sum of the diagonal entries. That, that is actually the sum of the jth powers of all of the non-zero eigenvalues. Um, and if you think about the, the graph context, um, the jth power of the adjacency matrix, uh, the ij entry gives us the number of distinct closed walks from vertex i to vertex j. Um, so again, we're looking at the trace. So those are the diagonal entries. So this gives us the number of closed walks. Um, 
meaning walks where the, the starting and ending vertex are the same thing. Uh, but this gives us the number of closed walks of length j in our particular graph. So we want to try to take this, this sequence, see if we can find a form for the sequence um, given by the trace of a to the j or these the number of closed walks of particular lengths, and see if we can apply some of our conditions to it to determine either moment rank or unitary rank for it. So in the last couple of minutes, let's look at just the complete graph. Um, we know that some uh, recurrence, some finite recurrence of, of some finite order, less than the number of vertices that we have, or less than or equal to, I should say, um, we can use that recurrence to define this sequence. So uh, just looking at the first couple of values, as with any graph on n vertices, the number of closed walks of length zero is just the number of vertices, so that's n. But the closed walks of length one are going to, there aren't any. Um, because if you traverse an edge, you're going to be different than where you started. Um, there's this many choices for A2, but let's try to determine a recurrence from here. So if I have some closed walk of, of order n, then there's two different, there's two cases. Um, either the last vertex and two from the end, so Wn minus two, either they're the same vertex or they're different. If they're the same vertex, then I have a closed walk of length n minus two. And essentially I can traverse one edge forward and backwards, however I'd, I'd like. And that gets me um, all of the, the closed walks of, of that form of length n. So because there are, uh, the complete graph is regular of degree n minus one, I have this contribution to uh, this recurrence that I'm trying to build up. Now, if that wouldn't be the case, so if Wn and Wn minus two aren't the same value, then essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a, a walk of length n minus one, delete the last edge, and then use two other edges to get to my destination. Um, and there are n minus two ways to do this. Um, so this contributes an extra a sum and of n minus two times a n minus one, or the number of closed walks of length n minus one in my graph. Um, putting these two together, I've covered every case. Um, so that gives us a linear recurrence for the number of closed walks in the complete graph on n vertices. Can look at the characteristic polynomial associated to this recurrence. So I've moved these two terms over to the other side, set it equal to zero, replace the a n with x squared a n minus one with x and a n minus two with just x to the zero. Uh, it factors in this way. So we see that the two different roots are n minus one and negative one. And uh, based on the initial conditions that we have, um, it's not too challenging to see that uh, the coefficient on n minus one has to be one and the coefficient on negative one has to be n minus one. So what this tells us is the moment rank of the trace of a to the j sequence is two, but the unitary rank is actually n because we have to break up these this n minus one coefficient into n minus one ones, so we get n different terms for the unitary rank definition. Um, so what that tells us is uh, the multiplicity of zero as an eigenvalue is zero, um, just because this unitary rank is actually the same as the rank of the adjacency matrix. Um, so the size is n. Now we know the rank of the adjacency matrix is n. So that tells us that the, the nullity or the multiplicity of zero as an eigenvalue is zero. So again, this is, nothing, this is nothing new or revolutionary for this particular example, but the idea is that we can do something like this for other kinds of graphs. Um, and then hopefully at some point, extended to hypergraphs. So that's all I have. Thank you very much for sticking around and, and being attentive. What questions do you all have? Thanks, Grant. We could all thank our speaker and then we'll go ahead and open it up for some questions. Do we have any questions for our speaker? Uh, Grant, what is the largest hypergraph uh, uh, you can compute the uh, characteristic polynomial? What's the largest size? Um, well, I. I, I don't I don't have a good answer to that. I, well, uh, the the so by size I mean number of edges, Lincoln, or yes, yeah, so maybe size the right, yeah, or vertex. Yeah, either way. Yeah. So just the, trivially, the the k unit the 
well, the, the K uniform hyper edge, uh, we mm -hmm. know that one. So as the uniformity grows, so does the number of vertices. So you can take that one infinitely. That's kind of trivial, probably not mm -hmm. a very satisfactory or satisfying answer. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. it depends on the structure of the edges. Like for yeah. example, the, the mm -hmm. hummingbird graph that uh, Greg and Josh had worked on, um, I think that was like 13 vertices, if I go way back here. Um, mm -hmm. But that was one of those linear trees which behave really nicely. Um, but I think it was 13 vertices. And so there's two, four, six, eight, okay. 10, 13 okay. vertices and uh, six edges. So that one's known. Um, but the Fano plane is seven vertices and mm -hmm. uh, one, two, three, four, five, and then two more. So seven edges. But that one we don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, so oh, that's interesting, yeah. it kind of yeah, depends it. on the, mm -hmm. the structure of the graph itself. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Okay, if not, thanks again, Grant. Uh, thanks everybody for making it out and uh, have a good weekend, everybody. Bye-bye.